the further you get into data engineering, the more you start to realize just how many different tools and components there are and the different options that you have. And while this is exciting, it also unfortunately leads to a lot of complexity too early in a lot of data architectures. So what I want to do in this video, as well as the next is break this down into hopefully something a little bit more digestible. We're going to cover what I call the 10 key modern data components. And this is based on my experience. And what I see is typically most effective for a vast majority of teams and people learning. So we'll start with the essentials in this video. And then in the next one, we'll cover what I call the advanced features. So here's the document for the 10 modern data components. And I'll also make sure to have a link to this document. If you want to have a copy for yourself, you can come download it completely free. I'll make sure you have a link to that below. So to get started, let's talk about number one, and this is storage and databases. And this shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody who's been in data for a while. At some point, you need to put data somewhere. And we can go down here to a visual. All of these have a visual along with a little bit of a description on different concepts here. So if we scroll down here, this, if we look here, we can see generally speaking in a data pipeline, this is where data is being loaded. Maybe that's a data lake of some sort or your data warehouse where you're creating custom models. The primary idea here is that in any data pipeline, you just need a place to put your data to store it. I don't think that should be as a surprise to anybody. Hopefully it's not. But if we don't cover that, there's really not much else we can do with our data. And in each of these components here, I also have a breakdown of how it's implemented, why it's helpful some examples, and maybe some languages and file types that you might see associated with it. I'm not going to go too deep into these, but we'll cover some of the points that I have here. So when I say storage here, really in my mind, what I'm thinking about is file storage, S3 buckets, blob storage, Google storage, a file server. And that's really what this is about here, because that's where you might be seeing something like a data lake, because it's just raw data being thrown in there. In, in all different formats, could be documents, could be videos, could be anything. This is where you might see temperature associated with storage. So something that's hot storage, just meaning it's quickly accessible. This is usually the default behavior compared to cold storage is something that you're not touching very often. So you get usually discounted pricing for having it as cold storage because you're saying, I'm not going to touch it for a while. It's also good for data backups. Then we have databases, which is a lot of what we typically work with. It could be structured, unstructured data warehouses. A lot of this can overlap. It depends on your design. Sometimes you don't even have any file storage. You just go straight to a database. We can see some points on why it's helpful. Database and storage, you need it for scalability, to have availability to your information. For databases, it adds more structure and organization organization, performance, security. The way I think about it most often is it's the hub of all of your information for which your whole architecture relies on. Storage is so important, particularly with databases, because that's where you have your data warehouse, you have your data marts, your data modeling, it's all done in there. Here we have a list of some example tools for both of these. And I want to be very clear up front here that this is by no means an exhaustive list. This whole point of this video is the fact that there are so many, but these are just a couple examples to get you going to think about it, maybe explore some new ones you haven't thought about. But we have the typical cloud storages. These are all the big cloud providers, their file storage options, cloud databases, which would be for here. These are the more what you would consider modern columnar databases. And there's, of course, many others that aren't listed here. We have the traditional row based databases that you might see as the application database, or you might still be using it for your primary analytics database. And then we have document databases, MongoDB, Cassandra DB. There's many more that aren't covered here, but these are some examples. And then we have the typical languages and file types that you might see associated with this component. So component number one, storage and databases. You can't really get too far in data engineering without understanding that. So that's obviously a huge component to understand. All right, moving on to number two is ingestion. We talked about having data and storing it, but how does it get there? To me, that is a foundational, incredibly important component. So there are different ways you could do it. You could batch load that, you could stream it in real time. For most of the clients I work with and really where I focus is this batch loading. I think for most companies, it's really all you need, but you may still encounter data streaming or real time data. And that's why I have this listed here. But regardless of the approach, what I want to emphasize here is that is still considered in my mind, data ingestion. That's how the data is moving from a source system to the storage. So you can, in your mind, bucket it into that one area. So again, we got batch, we got streaming, a lot of pre-built connectors, or you might have custom scripts. A lot of companies still use that. Depending on where you load it is really important. So this is where the system of your architecture comes into play. We have these different components, but they have to work together. And there's other videos on these topics in particular. Why is this helpful at a high level? We have data all over the place. We need to consolidate it to actually do something with it. So we need a way to do that. And that's what this component is all about. It allows data from across different systems to be fed into your environment. Now, again, we have example tools. These first few are some of the ones that you might see when talking about more batch pre-configured type of tools. So Fivetran, Stitch, Airbyte, many others, but those are just a few. Down here, we have some more real-time 
might consider data streaming. So we got Apache Kafka, Amazon Kinesis, Debezium is something you can plug into your databases to get more real time event style data as it happens sent into your storage if you want. And then of course, custom Python scripts, or it might not even be Python. It could be any language that you use to extract data and load it. There's plenty of ways you could do it. There's new things every day. But what's more important to understand is that this concept and this component is what all of that's about. How you do it is up to you, depending on your team and your skill set. but the goal is still the same. And here are some example languages and file types you might run into. Moving on to number three now is transformation. We have our data storage. We have that set up. We have a way to get data in there. Now, what do we do with it? We can't just look at it in its raw form. It's not really helpful most of the time. So we need to transform it. So that's why I have this here. And this could be done in one of two ways. Typically, you could have it transformed on a batch schedule, which I think is the most common way to do it. The other option is real time processing. So in that scenario it would be as data is moving along, maybe in this data stream, you can process things in real time. Again, I don't personally work much with that. I haven't really seen much of a need for many of the companies that I've worked at but it is absolutely a need at certain companies and it is a process that you can do. And it is a strategy that teams will implement. So that's why I list it here as well. And, but similar to ingestion, I like to think of them together because I like to think of it strategically as filling the same goal here. It's transforming the data. So this box here, I have all three because this is in my mind, the way I think about it is we have data that's stored and now we're transforming it to data models, maybe facts and dimensions or some sort of model. And then from there, it might be moving to a third layer, potentially, if you follow the three layer data model, which would be data marts. And this might be things that are ready for reporting and analytics that are structured for different use cases, but they are pulling from this warehouse. But all of that to me is part of the data transformation. So we talked about why it's helpful. And we talked about raw data by itself isn't what you really want. It's not as useful. You want to do something with it. You can apply real world rules, concepts, business logic, and maybe most importantly, it provides organization and consistency to your data so the company can use it. Because at the end of the day, we're doing a lot of stuff here. We're not doing this just for the sake of it. We're doing it to help a business make decisions and to be more effective. And that is why this area is so important because we're bringing that influence into the data and making it into something. And here are some more notes again on how it's implemented. We talked a little bit about this again. Typically it occurs after the data is already loaded. It can occur during the ingestion or not. Now let's talk about example tools. Again, not gonna get into every possible situation. And if you have certain ones that you've had good experiences with, feel free to leave a comment and share it with others. I'm sure there are more here. The big one in the game nowadays is DBT. It's one I've used the most. It's one that's by far, I would think the most popular at this point, but that handles this transformation component. Another example is Apache Spark. This tends to align more with this real-time processing, bigger data processing. You also have AWS Glue, Azure Data Factory, maybe SSIS, Informatica. Those are more of those graphical interfaces where you're dragging and dropping components and creating a data transformation pipeline that way, as opposed to these, which are more code-based. It's up to you and your team, which is, more preferred. The more recent trend is towards more code based tools, you can do a lot more with it, you can automate things a little easier, you can just customize things better. But that doesn't mean the other ones, these graphical interface ones don't have a place and they're not used, they totally are. And this is where they operate. Number four is reporting and analytics. The goal of this point now is we've brought our data in, we've created this pipeline, now we want to do something with it, we actually want to report off of it because data by itself, again, isn't that useful. We want to be able to make decisions and not us, but our business users, our stakeholders. So we need to serve it up to them in a way that makes sense. So this is where you're gonna see data visualization tools or maybe just additional logic somewhere. Maybe it's in an Excel report, or you might even group that into your data models here. I have this here because a lot of times they are designed with the analytics and the reporting use case in mind. So it's a kind of a blend between transformation and reporting and analytics, this layer here, that's why I have it. And this is really where you're getting into the real value of data. We do all this work behind the scenes. And this is the part that gets all the glory. This is what everybody sees. This is where you're getting insights, you're making predictions, analyzing what happens, making better decision. It's more user friendly. This is really you're putting it to use. So it's absolutely a critical component. And it's something that you need to understand as you get into data, or you just want to build your own architecture. So the big tools here, Power BI, Looker, Tableau, there are many open source ones that you can look at. So here's Metabase, Superset, many other great tools that again, if you have other ones, please leave a comment, let others know, share about it. There's so many great options, machine learning tools, there's AI now that you might see plugged into here. But generally speaking, sticking with the theme of this whole 
document here in this whole video is it's not about all these different options. There are many different tools that you could pick, but what you need to understand is where it fits in the bigger picture and what that component represents. And hopefully this is helping you understand that. Now, last but not least in the essentials is version control and CICD. I group these together because at least I tend to use them together. And I think in order to get the most value, you should be using them together. This is a way to not only monitor all the changes that have happened in a structured and transparent way, but it also helps you automate some of your tasks like deployments and scheduling. Most of the time, this is implemented on hosted platforms that most of us are familiar with. So I'm skipping around here, but if we hop down here to GitHub or GitLab, Bitbucket, Azure DevOps, but all of them seek to provide the same functionality, which is the version control of the Git project management. At a high level, you could really just say this is helpful for workflow, data team workflows, which has been a huge leap over the last few years. It'll help avoid conflicts. So you're not saving over each other as easily. There's processes in place, there's structure, there's branching, all sorts of stuff. CICD helps with you get into production faster, you have a process, you can remove manual tasks and be more iterative as I have here because you have a workflow in place to deploy and test changes to automate your schedule directly in the same platform if you want before you even need to add on anything else. You don't need a full dedicated orchestration environment really yet. You can do a lot of it directly in this same platform. That's why I group them together. So down here I have a visual that covers what this is supposed to represent. It's a little different than the other ones, but at a high level we have the data pipeline up top, going from sources to storage to analytics. And down here is trying to represent the fact that each developer in a development environment can have their own branch and their own storage location to work off. So that's what these represent, which is outside of production. And that's really the most important thing. This is all happening separate from production. And a lot of times if you set this up right, it can pull from the same raw data as your production environment, but you're deploying it separately. So by the time you get it to production, you can feel confident that your logic is going to work and that you've tested it thoroughly, which is really helpful, but you're not impacting this. So imagine the workflow here is a developer creates their own branch, their own testing area, and they want that to get to production. So they move it to a pre-production environment, maybe call it QA or UAT or test, whatever that is. And when you try to move that code along in the Git workflow, you're gonna trigger some sort of automation. And that's what this represents. And only once this is approved and looks good, then it gets moved to production. So rather than just saving right to production, you go through this process of getting it up there. You can have reviews from teammates, you can have automated checks. AI is becoming big here where it checks things for you and understands your code. So all of that here, regardless of the tools, regardless of the tech, it's the concepts and the strategy of this component and getting things moving. So to recap, here are the five essential modern data components. Number one, storage and databases. You need a place to store your data. Number two is data ingestion. You need a way to get your data into the storage and ingest it in. Number three is transformation. Once your data is loaded, it's in a storage location. How do you apply custom business logic to make sense of it and to have it be useful for later on? Number four is reporting and analytics. Once that data has been loaded in, it's been transformed, now we want to actually put it to use and have others interact with it and have it in the form of a report of some sort. And number five is version control and CI CD. We want that whole process to be smooth, well-documented and automated as much as possible, but in the most simple way, getting started. So if you just start by having those five components in place, you're gonna be in a great position to build and scale your architecture or join any team and speak to what each of those components represent. So again, if you found this helpful, I'll have a link to this document in the description below. You can grab a copy and have it for yourself as a reference. And in the next video, we'll talk about the next five components, which I consider the advanced once you have these in place. So with that said, thanks for watching and I'll see you at that next video.